morning, everyone. My name is Faye Cobb Payton. I'm a professor emeritus at North Carolina State University. It is my pleasure to serve as your moderator today for the first ACM panel on uh, Black for Black History Month. We have several panelists that will be participating today, and I am honored to be the moderator for this discussion. I would like for each of the panelists to introduce themselves by telling the audience your name, your affiliation, and your role within your organizations. And so I'll start with you, Happy, and then if you could tag someone else, and we'll get started. Okay, thank you, um, Bay, and um, uh, good uh, morning, everyone. I'm talking to you from Dublin, so it's almost in the evening. I almost said good evening. So my name is Happy Sitole, and I am affiliated with uh, the National Integrated Cyber Infrastructure in South Africa. This is a government initiative under the Department of Science and Innovation, and we are operating from the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. I'm happy to be involved in this conversation today. Thank you. Tag the next person. Okay, Matas. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Martez Mott. I'm currently a senior researcher in the Ability Group at Microsoft Research located in Redmond, Washington in the United States. Um, and there, I mostly conduct research in the fields of um, human-computer interaction and accessibility. Um, so um, next, I'll take tag Diana. Hello, everyone. I am Diana Burley. I am Vice Provost for Research and Innovation at American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, I am also a professor at AU, uh, professor of IT and analytics in the Kogod School of Business and a professor of public administration and policy in our School of Public Affairs. Uh, and my area of research is cybersecurity with a particular focus on building the cybersecurity workforce. Happy to be here. Juan, over to you. Thanks, Diana. Hello, everyone. I'm Juan Gilbert. I'm the chair of the computer science department at the University of Florida, where I'm an endowed professor and chair. And my area of interest is human-centered computing and computing for the social good. All right. Thanks, everyone. I appreciate those introductions. So let's have some discussion. Um, this is the first for Black History Month, first panel. Um, a number of us are on the ACM uh, Diversity Council. Some are on other committees within ACM. But I'd like to talk to you and ask, could you share with the audience key highlights of your career and your journey to the computing industry? And so I'm going to start. I'm starting always to my the boxes to my right. So Diana, you're up first in this instance. Sure. So um, I, I have had a, I think, windy path um, mm -hmm. to my present position, started off as a faculty member uh, and have maintained faculty member status throughout my career. Um, but after finishing graduate school at Carnegie Mellon University, I um, entered the professoriate and, and focused on how to um, how to think about the integration between social uh, and human behavior and technology uh, and computing uh, and migrated towards cybersecurity from that area. Um, went to a couple of different universities, started at Indiana University, moved to Syracuse University. Uh, and then I did a stint at the National Science Foundation as a program officer. And that's where I really began to um, get a, a broader view of the computing world across the United States uh, and the types of issues that, um, that our colleagues were addressing, um, both from a subject matter uh, perspective, but also from growing the, the workforce uh, and understanding the different diversity um, challenges that we face as a computing discipline. Um, I began my involvement with ACM early in my career 
and have done uh, a, a couple of different things for the organization. Um, most recently, uh, serving as the co-chair of a global task force to develop the first set of curricular standards in cybersecurity, uh, and in fact, in leading a, a, a follow-up effort um, to update those standards as we speak. Um, so those are just some of the some of the highlights. All right, thank you. It sounds like um, we have a, a few themes, and I'm catching catching the responses to see if your themes pop up as well. So Juan, you're up. Thanks, Faye. Yes, uh, similar to Diana, it's, it's a windy road. <laughs> so uh, I'm originally from a small town in Ohio, Hamilton, Ohio. I did my undergrad at Miami University and then I did my graduate work at University of Cincinnati. And I started my career at Auburn University as a tenure track assistant professor. I was there nine years, went through the ranks and my kids were born there. Faye, you remember that? And I do. <laughs> so then uh, I got a call one day from Clemson University saying we got a position for a new chair of a division in human centered computing and we'd like for you to come check it out. Uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so I didn't refuse it. And I ended up at Clemson University uh, I was there for five years doing my journey, and we were doing research, publishing, and we became the top producer of Black PhDs in computer science in the nation. And we had the largest group of Black PhDs. So then when I went to Clemson as a chair, I was able to hire. So I hired faculty, and we had the most tenure-track Black faculty in the nation in computer science. So then uh, I was there for five years and then Florida came and made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And like Diana, a windy road, I ended up in Florida. And when we moved to Florida, they moved five faculty, two postdocs and 20 PhD students. So we came here a year later, I became department chair. And again, we're doing research and innovative things in technology. So that's how I ended up where I am. All right, picking up on some themes, picking up on some themes. And yes, Juan, I do remember that. It's been a long time um, as well with Diana as well. So Martez, everyone talked about going um, through the PhD process, but you're in industry. So take us through your, I don't know if it's been a windy road, but let us hear some highlights from your career. Yes. Um... I, I will agree. So, I mean, I think one of the things that has stood out most to me has been I've been really fortunate to have um, good mentorship. So um, I started off not as a computer science um, undergraduate student. I was doing a major called electronics and communication technology. You can kind of think of it as like electrical engineering, but on the lighter side. And I was really fortunate that I took a, a CS201 class with a professor named Duke Hutchings, who you know, I vividly remember to say I turned in my final, Duke followed me out of the out of the class and said, hey, I think you're really good at this. I think you should pursue undergraduate um, research opportunities in computer science. And that's what I did. I got together with a group of people at Bowling Green State University, so also in Ohio one, um, that was uh, working on human computer interaction. And I got really interested in that topic and I got learned more about accessibility and that led me to apply the PhD program at the information school at the University of Washington. Um, so there I was surrounded by a lot of great mentors, a lot of people doing really fantastic accessibility and HCI work. And I also was really fortunate to have opportunities to intern at Microsoft Research. Um, so I did two internships there as a PhD student. And I was very fortunate that when I was graduating, um, the people I was working with at the time were starting a new group, an ability group, all focused on doing accessibility research within MSR. So I joined there as a postdoc in 2019 after I graduated. I did a postdoc for about a year and a half, and then I transitioned to the full-time senior researcher role, and I'm still there. Um, so it's, it's been, definitely been different <laughs> paths along the way that I could have taken, but I've been really fortunate to have mentors who have really um, led me in, in really good directions and I've followed their advice. So, and it's been working out pretty well for me, so. All right, thank you. So I remember you, right? We had that moment at the the I, I school I3 conference that you pitched. So, okay, there's a connection there. 
So happy. Bring this, bring this home. Is your road windy as well? Tell us about your highlights. Yeah, no, thank you, Faye. That's um, also similar to uh, my fellow panelists. Um, it didn't start as uh, initially I'm going to be in the computer uh, environment. So I did my BSc and my May I was mathematics and physics. And I just wanted to be a physicist. Mm -hmm. And um, as I pushed on that and I did my undergrad, I did uh, uh, my master's in Canada, my undergrad here in South Africa. And I came back to South Africa and joined the faculty teaching in the physics department. And whilst I was doing that, I did my PhD, and that was focusing on material science. And my challenge was to solve the issues in material science, and I wanted to do modeling and simulation. So I needed the computer. So I had to start working in putting together clusters so that I can be able to have computational power and I got hooked into that. So I finished my PhD and I applied uh, my PhD studies in different environments, like in mining industry, where I was solving some of the mining industry challenges using computers and also got in into nuclear power plant designs, also a lot of uh, modeling and simulation there. So today I run what we call the national integrated cyber infrastructure. So basically putting the first uh, center for high performance computing. In the US, we will have many of those like your Oak Ridge National Lab and Argonne and the likes with big supercomputers. So we started building this capacity in South Africa and that's what I'm leading. And, and, and today now my role has increased from there. I am looking at the overall cyber infrastructure, no longer just high performance computing, but also ensuring that we have got the broadband uh, capacity and also looking at the big data analytics in the country. So that's the role that I, I handle. But um, the other thing is uh, to try and expand this uh, for the whole of the African continent, uh, pushing on collaboration amongst African countries in using computing to solve some of the challenges in the continent. All right, thank you. So with that one question, I picked up on a couple of themes that I wrote down. I heard winding roads, right? Paths that sort of up, down. I heard interdisciplinary, I heard high schools, I heard nuclear power plants. I heard a physicist that said he needed computing. I have someone in a business school, I have someone in, uh, school of Computing. Um, interesting points that um, out of your work, Diana, you and I both were program officers at the National Science Foundation, which gives you sort of that national and sometimes global perspective on what's happening in computing. And you talked about the challenges. And um, Juan, you really talked about being top producer of PhD students and sort of taking that model on and you know, Martise, you talked about the importance of um, REUs, which is something I'm sure Diana, like I did when at the National Science Foundation, I know Juan, you had plenty of REUs and that research experience, how important that is. And happy, I was um, glad to hear that you needed computing, computational power um, when it came for your material science work and how you're bridging that to address some of the social and other uh, challenges that are there on the continent. So let's talk about some of those challenges. Uh, what do you see to the panelists? What do you see as some of the challenges, but also some of the opportunities for the computing industry at this time? And so Juan, we're gonna start with you. Well, I think there's, challenges uh, with respect to, oh man, there's a lot of them, but when we look at our, our opportunity to broaden participation in computing, for example, there's a challenge in that acknowledging that you want to do that mm -hmm. and putting forth the effort to do it. Uh, it's easy to say, yeah, we should do that thing, 
but what are you going to do to make it happen? Taking the necessary action, and, and in some places in a political climate that is, uh, you know, contradictory to that. Uh, so I, I think that's a major challenge. I think the the benefit, uh, the upside to, to computing industry right now is that the pervasive nature of computing. When I was in grad school in the 90s and things, I still had to explain a lot about computing to people. Now with computing being everywhere, everyone has smartphones and things, they understand the value of computing and the impact of it. So the pervasive nature of computing enables us to reach the non-scientific, the non-technical community in ways that were much more challenging prior to this pervasiveness of computing. So I think that's an opportunity that we can leverage. But I, again, I think the, the challenge in particular is broadening participation in computing, especially in industry and in academia as well, acknowledging that it has to be done is the easy part. Now, what will you do about it? Interesting. Um, Martise, how do you how do you respond to the challenges that you see currently at, or responding to what Juan has just laid out? Yeah, so one one thing building off what Juan just described is is, is kind of the person the pervasiveness of computing, I think, necessitates the need for more um exposure and communication with different fields so i think that there is a big interdisciplinary nature that needs to kind of be accepted when we think about computing so computing isn't an isolated field that acts independently from all the other pillars of knowledge that exist it's actually quite intertwined and interdependent on a lot of other fields so especially if we think about some of the kind of emerging technologies like a lot of these generative ai models that could pose different types of risk and also provide different benefits. But I think, for example, we need to understand these impacts at a societal level, not just at the technological achievement level as well. So I think bringing in more interdisciplinary schooling and education into these programs can be really beneficial as we create technologies that have far, have much farther reach than maybe most people would have predicted you know, decades prior. And I would just say to add something else, in my line of work, I'm focused a lot on accessibility. So thinking about how can we make computing devices, services, and applications more accessible to people with disabilities? And I think this is something that too, that when we think about computing, we really need to kind of broaden our perspective of what does it mean to actually build for other people and to really challenge the assumptions we make when we do that designing and building. So if you're a student and you're building an application, or if you're a startup, if you're at a startup and you're thinking about what your next application gonna be, you really need to sit, sit there and ask yourself for a second, who can benefit from this technology and how can they benefit from it? And if people with disabilities aren't really factored into that equation, then I think they really should be. And we need to do a better job of making sure that disability is something that's prioritized in the development and um, execution of different technologies. Okay. And, and Happy, can you give um, your perspective, particularly from uh, the South African global perspective on this? What are the challenges? I think uh, more um, relax uh, with uh, the fast pace in which the technology is evolving now, uh, driven by the demand uh, on its application. Mm -hmm. uh, like one says, uh, it's almost now computing is pervasive. But uh, what is more challenging is that almost all our lives, we have to do some sort of computing. And, and, and when we look at this, the technology is moving, the demand in why it is applied, it's, uh, it's fast paced, but uh, there is a gap in people catching up in being ready. So, and you know, you get uh, that divide, which uh, we can call the digital divide. Uh, it could be in the skills, but also some then will be in access. So those uh, to me are the main things that uh, for us to be able to move together, uh, we should be able to catch up the, 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 the population and the, the, how the technology moves. 
we have to close that gap so that we can be able to leverage the opportunities that the, the advancement in technology is bringing. Okay. Uh, Diana, uh, I, I want to get your response to that as well, particularly as, you know, in your role as research and innovation lead on your campus. How do you see the challenges, but what are some of the opportunities as well here? Yeah. So, I mean, really building on everything that, that my colleagues have said, I want to stick on this notion of the pervasiveness of computing and how that relates to the interdisciplinary nature of the field. Because that's really where I think that this notion of innovation um, can, combines with the challenges that we face. Because as we look at the way that the higher education enterprise is structured, you know, very siloed, we have schools that focus in one particular area. And the way that we train and educate individuals, we tend to do that in single areas. But because computing is so pervasive and because it is, it, it is so interdisciplinary in nature, we have the opportunity to innovate the way that we educate at the collegiate level, but all the way downstream so that rather than focusing on separate or disparate disciplines, we can integrate it together and help people to understand how all the pieces fit together. That really does give us an opportunity to bring all different types of individuals into the discipline in the place that makes the most sense for them. It allows us to prepare them in a much more effective way um, because we can make sure that the content resonates with them and the types of challenges that they are seeing. Uh, and so it, it does provide us with an opportunity to really think creatively about the education enterprise all the way from the very beginning through the, the collegiate um, levels. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack in the responses that were given. So I want to do a little of that before we move to the next question. So one of the things that was mentioned here is pervasiveness um, of computing. agree on is pervasive, something that was said, um, that Happy mentioned about um, the gap, right? And, and I think there are a number of types of gaps and, and, you know, it's not just a digital gap or an access. I think this sort of dovetails with the notion that you brought up one about broadening participation. Uh, can you speak to the opportunity gap when there is the work is not being done to reach that broad anticipation point that you're talking about. Yes, I mean, the opportunity gap is real. That's, we see this now, meaning, um, and I, I'm just going to be honest with people, uh, computing and IT has high salaries. It changes, it could change your standard of living for you and your family. Now, when you have that kind of, standard of living and then you exclude members of the population you're creating a, a divide essentially and and so there are opportunities for companies to hire and opportunities for universities to recruit and hire and and do more but you know they 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 say we would love to be diverse we would love to have these things but you know when you ask what are you doing well we don't exclude that's not doing anything <laughs> to not to not to say I'm not excluding is not doing something. So you got to take action. You have to be deliberate and 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 trying to diversify. Now there are several articles, publications, research to show the benefits of having a diverse workforce and diversity in teams. Mm -hmm. This is documented all over the place. If you want to be innovative, if you want to uh, be a leader, you want to, to capture the best ideas, the best way to do that is bring a diverse team together and being able to assemble diverse teams and, and solve problems in diverse ways. Uh, you know, I, I think about Martez and, you know, what we do on accessibility. It's real easy to design something in a room with a group of people who are like you. And then all of a sudden you release that product and now they got to recall it because people who are colorblind can't see it 
or people who have some kind of visual impairment can't use it, things like that. You know, if, if, if they had thought and diversified their team, there may have been a colorblind person on the team. There may have been someone with a disability. They may have had people with diverse perspectives who would have stopped that ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So those are some examples of the opportunity gap is real. Yes. And the benefits of diversity have been documented and there are ways to do it. But saying we don't exclude people is not an actionable thing. Okay. Now, it, does anyone want to respond to that before I ask the next question off of that? Okay. So, Marta, something that you said was when you design for accessibility and design for the other and design for benefit. And I, I do believe that, you know, well-intended, but doesn't mean that the benefit will happen. What about when design causes harm? How, how do you respond to that aspect of the work? No, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And I think harms are really in conversations right now when people are, especially like I mentioned before, with these kind of new AI models and people are talking about the capabilities that they have. So what harm might it do to education? Because maybe students now don't think about writing essays in the same way anymore because mm -hmm. they're using these generative language models to do that or what harm could be done to artists because people are using generative AI models to create you know art pieces of art that they're going to use throughout their products and services so I, I really think a, a value kind of approach to this is really important and I think it's really interesting or really important to be critical when designing or developing any technologies to kind of do these exercises of trying to predict what the potential harms of technologies could be and to try your best to mitigate them at all possible. There's always going to be unintended consequences anytime you use technology. There's, there's too much diversity of human experience to be able to accurately predict how everyone everywhere on the planet is going to use something that you create. But I do think that taking the steps to actually think through some of the potential harms will get you a, lot, a long way towards trying to rectify those things before they can become too big. And like Juan said, once these things are kind of out there, it's hard to kind of roll them back and actually be able to do the deep, insightful work you need to from the beginning to actually make these products and services more inclusive and actually predict or reduce harm when possible. And so Faye, Faye, I wanna jump in real quick on that, give an yeah. example. Um, and some of you are familiar with this. So what happens, Faye, when I train computer vision algorithms at a predominantly white institution on students at that institution? So I get the algorithms learn what people look like, and they tend to be of white complexion. Mm -hmm. So those algorithms get very good at what they do, Faye. And then, you know, you say, well, ooh, computer vision works. Let's implement this on self-driving vehicles. Mm -hmm. So what happens when a person of color walks out in front of that vehicle? Yeah. So when you talk about harm, this is really harmful in, in many ways when you lack these opportunities and diverse perspectives. Sure. Okay. Great example. So, so let's stick with the examples for a second. So happy you mentioned um, a lot of what's going on, particularly in South Africa. Give us some opportunities of how computing can address can be can provide some opportunities and likewise how the field can benefit from inclusion when addressing the opportunities there. Now I think uh, the, 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 one of the things just latching on the harm part um, for an example when we talk about automation, one of the scary part is people thinking now this is going to take jobs. And, and, and looking at that part to say as uh, computing advances and uh, people being afraid that um, jobs are going to be lost, I think the opportunity that is there then is how do we uh, bring in uh, more new skills in, in the market? And, and this is where I see the opportunities that we can be able to start uh, training people in, in, in new ways. Uh, this is uh, at the industry level and also at our education sector level uh, to be able to come up with new careers, 
And uh, the other thing, uh, for an example, in Africa specifically, is that uh, a lot when you, you you still have got this is a growing continent, and and also being a growing continent, you've got the, the bigger population being the young people, and 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 that's a big opportunity to be able to get these people in the computing environment and and to be able to advance all the the potential growth that computing can be able to bring in uh, developing the continent. Okay, great lead in. So Diana, to that point, th this really gets to your notion of innovating in a way that's interdisciplinary. And everyone has talked about new skills, new careers, but really what does the academy have to do? I know we say that, we say interdisciplinary, but I don't know that we necessarily award, reward disciplinary, interdisciplinary. Can you speak to that as the you know, VP of research and innovation? Yeah, I mean, so even if we look at the mainstay of being a faculty member, tenure, right? The tenure process. Mm -hmm. Does the tenure process <clears throat> allow for the um, evaluation of interdisciplinary work. Because when we go through tenure processes, we tend to focus on a single discipline, getting letters from people who are in a single discipline, journal articles in a single discipline. And so the way that we reward our faculty members is not by um, doing interdisciplinary work as they move through their career. We reward, we reward them for doing very mainstream um, traditional work. And then we expect them to transition at some point later, right? And so we've got to get to a place where we recognize the value of interdisciplinary work in our reward systems, because that's what will then allow our faculty members to, to do the kind of work that we're talking about. Same thing goes with, with working with students, right? If we put incentives in place that inhibit faculty members' abilities to engage with their students in different ways and substantive ways around research, um, saying that we want faculty members to, to work with students in research is great, but if we disincentivize that, um, then it doesn't happen. So it really does become an issue of understanding the incentive structures, understanding the culture within the academy, and having people in the administrative roles um, where they can make a difference and, and make those adjustments. So Juan being a department chair is a really critical role because he can help to ensure that his faculty members as they go through their evaluation process are evaluated on the, the type of work um, that, that really does make an impact. Okay, thank you, that's good. So you mentioned about working with students and Martez, you talked about the importance of your REU experiences. Can you unpack that for us just a little bit? What was it about the REU experience? Yeah, so for me, it really opened up my eyes to just kind of like a, a different faction of what computing could be, what research is in general. I mean, I, um, first generation college student, so didn't really have others to talk to these issues about really get a great understanding of like, what is research even? What, is, what do people do in research at higher education levels? And so to be able to kind of have an undergraduate research experience where you kind of get some freedom and flexibility, but you also really get a lot of one-on-one -on -one mentoring allows you to kind of understand and well, for me, really broaden my perspective of what could I do with this degree? So, you know, it can kind of feel sometimes that if you're taking a computer science class, you're like, oh, really, I got to take like another algorithm class, or this is the second part of data structures. And it all seems, you know, very abstract, right? Like, oh, I'm learning about all these concepts, but what good are they, right? And then once you get into a research experience, and it's like, hey, let's leverage all the things that you've learned and all the things that you've done and actually put them towards something that can be really practical or useful, either in the short term or maybe in the far in the future, but getting that experience and understanding kind of the possibilities that exist, I think are some of the best things um, that can happen out of those experiences. And I think having faculty who are really interested and motivated to work with students and really teach them, not only in the classroom, but in a lot of those like 
you know, small things, right? Like, oh, this is your first time giving a poster presentation. Let me really sit down with you and tell you like how this is going to go. Or are you going to give your first conference presentation? Are you going to write your first paper? There's all these kind of small touch points that are really important for establishing someone's career and getting that experience early for me was really great. I wouldn't be here without it. So. Oh, great. good to know. Juan, can you chime in because you've led a lot of these efforts uh, with REUs and and can speak to what has happened to those students um, after they've completed the REU experiences with you and your team. Yes, I mean, the REUs are um, gold mines. I mean, they are so valuable. Um, I find students still today, like myself, who are first generation, they don't know anything about graduate school research. They're going to college to get a job and that's their intent. So when they get an opportunity to do research, because what happens is they, they come to college, they have in their mind, I'm going to get my degree, get a job. And as part of that, they, are, they understand they have to do internships. So students mm -hmm. understand the internship model perfectly. Everybody knows that. They know how to apply and everything. And the, the mm -hmm. university and department supports that. But the REU model is more ambiguous and not as frequently shared. So students need to understand, if you do an REU, you spend the summer at a university and you get paid to do research at that university. This isn't mm -hmm. a volunteer service. So mm -hmm. you can be paid to do an REU like you're being paid to do an internship and you do research. And that will expose you to other alternatives for a future career. It's very important. My students have gone on to be professors. They work yeah. in industry, they're leaders. And the REU was instrumental in changing their perspective and their trajectories. Mm -hmm. We share some of those students, remember? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, please, please, Diana. Just on that, because sometimes our administrators or our, our university faculty members think that you have to get external funds to support the REU programs and, and large scale programs, but you really don't. This is an area where as an institution, you can set aside funds to ensure that you're able to support student-based research during the summers. And to ensure that um, providing those funds allows you to have a diverse set of students who engage with faculty members in research. Because if you don't provide those funds, what happens is the students who are of means, who can afford to not work, or who mm -hmm. can afford to, as Juan says, volunteer, um, mm -hmm. they get those experiences, but the students who need to work don't. And what you don't want to do is to have students who otherwise could be phenomenal um, research assistants um, who could prepare for graduate study going and working at a restaurant during the summer because you're not able to pay them and they need to, to work. And so I really encourage um, those who are in faculty or administrative roles who are listening to, to, to take a look at what does it really cost to support a, su a student for the summer and finding those, those resources uh, so that you can encourage your students to participate is really, really important. Okay, happy. And Diana, oh. real quick, Diana, the, the second part of your story that you're, you're mentioning is a lot of these students, they do well with the REU. And you know what? If they're at their home institution, the faculty member likes them. And guess what? They get paid opportunities during the academic year. Yeah. So, yeah. so students, hear what I'm saying. Exactly. You do a, a research experience in the summer, you get paid, you do a good job. And if you happen to be at your home institution, that professor or faculty member you're working with says, I like this student. I want to keep them on the project. So what happens? They're willing to pay you to do research during the academic year. And in some cases, Faye, as you know, you mm -hmm. can get academic credit for this. That's right. So you can satisfy degree requirements by doing research and be paid at the same time. At the same time. Yeah. Uh, Happy, is there something that you want to add about the idea of having undergraduate students um, get involved in research. No, absolutely, I agree with this. It's, um, and, and when I was um, at university teaching, um, one of the things that we're looking at was identifying students, say, for an example, who are in physics and also have some background of computer science, and giving them opportunities to work in the high-performance computing environment. And it started off with uh, simple things like 
go and search like journals and they read a little mm -hmm. bit about that. And, and today those students, they got hooked and they went on, did their research and they are now professors uh, in South Africa. Mm. Uh, the other thing that I, uh, I also saw is uh, specifically on high performance computing because traditionally it did not start as a, a taught uh, subject in any faculty because it's integrated. So a lot of people who come in there it's uh, via their experience in using computers in some way like myself in material science. So you, you don't have people coming like an undergraduate being exposed at this. And, and, and now there is a program that uh, has been introduced where we call the student cluster challenge. And also in the US, it was there, it was started by some colleagues in the national labs and now all over the world, we're trying to bring in undergraduate students to start knowing about high performance computing at undergraduate, not to be exposed at that when they get uh, to um, uh, postgraduate at our research level. And it really enhances the quality of uh, the, the, the people that we get uh, in the field because now they uh, they get exposed at an earlier stage. So I fully agree with those opportunities being given to students at an earlier stage. And I agree with one. I think uh, the students uh, who are listening, uh, these opportunities for an example ourselves, we did not get them when we grew up. So now they are there. So I will encourage the students to really take up uh, these opportunities and make sure that it can be the game changer in their life. All right, thank you. So um, next question, what are some of the best practices for securing, securing research funding from a professor? We talked about some of those, or and or a student. And can you give examples that include the tech industry and government collaborations in your own experiences? So Happy, why don't we start with you and then we'll go to you, Diana, after that. Yeah, I think uh, in, in, in doing this, it's, it's important, uh, the, the, the part that you said, you know, collaboration and partnership. And, and for us to be able to provide these opportunities, it's not just going to be universities or governments that will do this. It will take universities, governments, and also industry. The program that I just highlighted on the Student Cluster Challenge, for an example, where uh, we have got uh, in South Africa, our government put in some money, but uh, we have uh, some of uh, the uh, computing industries uh, who also put in money to get uh, the students to be exposed in the research labs. Um, so it makes a, a, a really a good opportunity for everyone to get involved and, and provide um, opportunities for students. So, I fully agree with that method. And I think that's the only way that's going to take us forward. Okay, Diana. Um, so on the student piece, the only part that I would add as a best practice is that the students need to ask. Don't be shy. Go talk to your faculty member and ask them if they have research opportunities available because when they know that you're interested, they're more likely to, to give you the information and to let you know that the opportunity exists. I know one of the ways that we do that at AU in an institutionalized way is we actually have an office and a website that collects student research opportunities so that our students, even those who maybe aren't as, um, as eager to interface with faculty members directly uh, can go to the website and start to get information on that. Um, on the in this sort of ties in um, finding opportunities for faculty members with the interdisciplinary conversation one of the things that we are seeing is that there are many more opportunities for funding both from the government and from industry that um, if not require strongly encourage interdisciplinary teams of faculty members so bringing together the so social scientists with the computer scientists um, so that we are able to conduct research within context, right? That's what we're mm -hmm. seeing is that the, the world of funding is recognizing that grand challenges do require us to think from a problem-based perspective 
and to then apply the disciplines in a collaborative way. And so that is something that as you are seeking funding and seeking to understand more about what's happening in computing, find your colleagues uh, and, and build those teams together so that you can address these larger problem-based um, opportunities. Martez, do you wanna add something, particularly being there at Microsoft Research, about uh, best practices when it comes to collaboration between higher ed and industry? Yeah, I mean, I think what Diana just said there about building teams um, of interdisciplinary nature and making sure that there's kind of like a potential value add there, I think is something that's really important. I mean, I'll know from my, albeit limited experience of seeing grants and other type of funding opportunities from the Microsoft research side. What I can say is that I do think that there is a strong desire for people to work with interdisciplinary teams that do have that mix of expertise and that can add some beneficial um, learnings to whatever research, you know, or whatever project that is going on at the time. And I will say that I think, you know, building connections with people in industry also does require some slight changes in language or how to influence yes. people. I do think that, mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a graduate student, we learn a lot of the NSF terminologies that we think will be beneficial in talking about the scientific merit of the work or what are the broader impacts of the work. But I think sometimes when you're dealing with um, people in industry, they might have different type of values or different type of uh, parameters or different type of details that they're looking for. And I think it's important to kind of surface, surface those as well in the conversations when thinking about, well, what can this industry partner also benefit from in whatever collaboration is happening with their academic counterparts? Sure. Very good point. Yeah, it is a language. It is a language interchange that can be very different. Um, and the scales of success measures often don't align. And so that takes work. And Juan, to that um, respect, would you like to add something to the responses that you've heard? No, they said, everything I, they said everything I would. Okay. All right. So I want to go back to something that we talked about in terms of REU because we did get a question to come through. So we have a faculty member who's on the line uh, from a community college. And this person says, I have students that can't do REUs because they can't afford to leave their current job for the summer, even if they get paid for the summer. Who'd like to respond to that? I'll just say those, those cases have to be evaluated on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. I can't say anything generally to benefit or how that student could benefit from this without knowing more of the context. Uh, for example, is that community college near a major university? A lot of community colleges are. If they are, there may be an opportunity there. Again, I, I threw out the option of getting course credit if they can't leave their job, then during the academic year, do it instead of taking, uh, if they're undergrad, instead of taking 15 hours, take uh, 12 hours and let three hours of it be research or something. There, there's other alternatives, but uh, I'd be happy to engage with people on the particulars for an individual on how to accommodate them. I do think there are options, even for those students. Mm -hmm. I would add too that it, depending on the type of job, because I agree with Juan, it, it's definitely a case by case basis, but depending on the type of job and the employer, there may be an opportunity to link the research to something that's happening at work, mm -hmm. right? Where the employer would be willing to allow them a, a few hours a week to engage on the research topic if they are able to then provide those results back to the employer to help with some challenge that they're having in the workplace. So there's definitely creative options, um, ways to, to link those things together. So it's, it's certainly worth exploring. All right, thank you. So we have a, a few minutes. I do wanna ask this question. This was not on your list, but you know, here on this panel, and this is a Black History Month panel, um, the role of inclusive leadership. We're going back to that very first question 
or a point that you raised, Juan, about broadening participation and doing the work. It is important to have uh, inclusive leadership. And um, I want just to ask a quick question because I see Martiz, that you're in industry and happy you're at a national level and Diana, you're at the institutional level, Juan, you're at the departmental level. What, do, what does inclusive leadership and why, what is inclusive leadership to you and why is it important in the space of computing at this moment, at this time. So who like to take that first? Okay, I can try and- Okay. First. Um, uh, for, for, for me, inclusive leadership, it's important that we can tap into all the uh, potential that we have. Mm -hmm. And if we go into half, um, uh, opportunities that uh, do not uh, involve everyone, um, it means that we can only be limiting ourselves to, to grow into full potential. So I, mm -hmm. I really believe that we have to look at the, what are the, the barriers of uh, entry to mm -hmm. other parts of um, uh, our society in getting into computing and work on um, ensuring that we can break down those barriers. Um, uh, in, a, in, in, in my case in South Africa, for an example, um, because of the history of the country, you still have got a lot of patches where other people cannot have access to facilities, for an mm -hmm. example. So you have to make sure for a simple thing like connectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and hence, we've got such a big digital divide. And, and, and you will find that a big portion of the population cannot have access, uh, say, to data or have access to the facilities. Then we, we, we're limiting ourselves. And that's one of the things that we try to push to make sure that, that we get uh, everyone involved in that. And, and the other thing that we see is um, the, the gender representation where we find that uh, in, many, in many cases, we do not have many women in these fields of computing. And, and intentional interventions needs to be looked at in making sure that we bring in this. And, and for an example, in some of the programs that we put, we want to make sure that um, we, not just a question of numbers, but we have to make sure that at least how we constitute uh, teams or people, we have to make sure that that gender that is not represented, um, it's intentionally being put into um, uh, the, the space. So uh, these are some of the initiatives that uh, I can think of. Um, okay. I, hmm. Okay, we'll just get one more response from that. Diana, can I point you to that? And then Juan and Martiz, I have a, a separate question from you for you for the from the audience. Diana? Yeah, so leaders set the vision. Mm -hmm. Leaders control the resources. Leaders determine the policies. Leaders serve as mentors. Leaders serve as exemplars, right? So having an inclusive community really does depend on the level of inclusivity in the leadership because that's what drives the organization. And so if we're talking about different areas of computing, ensuring that you have individuals who are able to push, um, push diversity and inclusivity in a number of different ways, in every different way, um, requires that, that you have um, that level of diversity in the leadership ranks. I don't think we've talked enough about the policy piece, but mm -hmm. the leaders are the ones who really do put those guardrails up, right? They're the ones who right. say, here's the, here's where the road, right? Here are the boundaries. Right. Here's what, here's the way that we are going to um, enact all of the different activities. And so having people who have a broader perspective, who are always thinking um, about the collective uh, in a in a much broader way ensures that um, that we do have policies and and um, the ability to participate um, by a wide variety of people in our society. Okay, all right. So we have a question from the audience for Mark and 
Juan, I'll give this to you, topics that are relevant and that have the potential to make an impact? That's a question from an audience member. Who's going to go first? I can go first. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think just to kind of um, bring up themes that have already been discussed, I, I do think that there's opportunities to look at um, places where interdisciplinary research could, could really be beneficial. So for example, if you're a person who's in the field of computing and you really want to say like, hey, how can I make a difference or what can I do that's really impactful? I would really think about kind of what are your values and what do you think some of the world's challenges or problems are and to put your efforts and focus into working with or partnering with people who are working on some of those efforts. So for example, if you're someone who's really invested in the future and you're really worried about climate change, then maybe work with climate scientists to kind of help develop better climate models or better storage or better sensors or whatever technologies might be needed for us to get a better understanding of what's happening to the environment, right? Or if you're a person who's really interested and understanding kind of more social um, dynamics between people and you're really interested in interconnectedness and what is social media doing to the kind of weak and strong ties that we have with people in our community, then, you know, partner with sociologists or psychologists to really understand how these technologies can be built in a better, you know, a better, more inclusive way. So that would be some of my kind of advice would be to, to seek out some of these things that people are really interested in, these kind of societal needs or concerns, and then partner up with relevant experts to help devise new solutions for those problems. All right, Juan, we need you to be real quick on this one so I can get my last question okay. in. I, I agree with Martez on everything. Uh, I think it's about passion. Uh, you know what, what problems there are. You see it on TV, on social media, in the newspaper. Uh, think about ideas and use your technical expertise to solve them. Whatever you're passionate about, follow your passion. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, so last question in the time that we have remaining. So we want to close out um, the panel, you know, sort of on a high note. So if we can go around Robin and give maybe one or two examples of encouraging actions as we close out the ACM first Black History Month panel. Diana. Well, I, I think this panel is an encouraging action. Right. I mean, talk about putting action behind um, behind statements that diversity and inclusion is important. Having a panel like this, having uh, role models, people from all across uh, the world, from different types of, of backgrounds, um, says that um, that ACM is serious. Uh, about um, pushing for diversity, equity, and inclusion in computing. And so I, I would just use this panel as, um, as a great first step. Okay, happy? Oh, thank you, Faye. Um, I think um, what, what is important is uh, providing the opportunities for growth. And, and indeed, we need to be able to identify people who have got potential, mentor them, and 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 make sure that they can be able to grow. So yeah, and okay. and bear with um, uh, Diana, this panel it's uh, it's it's a good start, and we should uh, have more of this in uh, mentoring uh, young black people to get into computing. Okay, Martins. Yeah, so my kind of final takeaway was just to be courageous. I mean, I know from my personal, like for myself, there's been a lot of opportunities that I either passed on or didn't apply to or, you know, didn't feel that I was um, right for or that I had the, the correct expertise or knowledge just because, you know, maybe I didn't see people that look like me in, you know, the environment that I wanted to be in or I didn't see people that look like me and in those spaces. So just be courageous, put yourself out there and then try your best, even when it doesn't seem like those opportunities might be for you. All right, Juan, close us out. What are your encouraging words, actions? Well, in society, there's no shortage of problems. Find something you're passionate about and change the world. You can do it. The fact in particular, if you are from an underrepresented group, you're a minority, that's not a disadvantage, that's an advantage. 
because you see the world differently. You're not going to have the same ideas as everyone else. Use your skills. Change the world. All right. Well, with that, I think we will conclude the panel with this one comment from a listener. And the, and the listener says, this was very inspirational and motivating. I am in my second semester of human-centered computing and haven't seen much of us in the published works that we study or even in my class. So this was inspiring and motivating. So I wanna thank each one of you. I was happy to be the moderator for this event for ACM. And with that, we will conclude the panel and thank you for attending.